So on May 6th of 2019, the sun was shining, the sky was blue, clouds were that puffy white. It was a perfect spring day. I was walking back to my office, and my phone rang, and it was one of my lieutenants. I said, hey, John, how are you? He said, sir, I'm good, but I've got some bad news. He said our executive officer died that weekend. We went back and forth. I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I asked him what happened. He said, sir, he killed himself. I walked around my office for a couple hours in a complete fog, trying to understand what had happened, why. I had just communicated with him a few months earlier, and I had no idea that this officer was in trouble. And I fault myself as a leader for not having known that. Hello, visionaries, creators, innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders of all types. Hi, my name is John Miles, and I wanted to welcome you to this episode of the Passion Struck Podcast, where it is my job to interview high achievers from all walks of life and unlock their secrets and lessons to becoming passion struck. The purpose of our show is to serve you, the listener, by giving you lessons, tools, and activities that you can use to achieve a passion-driven life. Now, let the journey begin. This is episode 37 of the Passion Struck Podcast. And as you can tell from the way that this video started, you already know it's not a normal Passion Struck Podcast episode. And I use today's Momentum Friday episode to invite the person from that TED Talk, my long-term friend and Naval Academy classmate, Chuck Smith, onto the show so that we could talk not only about suicide, but in honor of post-traumatic stress disorder month, the growing link between PTSD and suicides. And as I was getting ready for this show, I started to do some research after watching Chuck's video. And I read the latest report that came out from the VA in 2020 on the national veteran suicide rate and conditions. And in this report, it showed that in 2018, there were 46,510 suicides. If you look at that another way, that's nearly 128 suicides per day. And out of those, the report indicated that 17.6 of those was a veteran or armed forces member. And the rates are only climbing. In fact, from the year 2005 to 2018, the rate of suicide has grown by 47%. And then as I dug deeper, I found a 2017 report from the National PTSD Center that indicated that the association between PTSD and suicide is even greater for members of the armed forces and veterans. In fact, a study they did from 2001 to 2009 showed that army members who had PTSD were 13 times more likely to have suicide. And it's not just in the veteran population. The study also showed that over 22% of sexual trauma victims ended up trying to take their life. And over 23% of physical assault victims had the same trending. And it gets even worse if a person has had multiple incidents of trauma, in some cases doubling, and in other cases tripling that 22 or 23% chance. And I would encourage each and every one of you to go to Chuck's TED Talk and listen to his words of wisdom and his plea for us to do something about this growing dilemma. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about Chuck Smith. Charles, as we know him, Chuck Smith has created a life focused on service to others, first in the military, then as a financial advisor and branch manager, and most recently as an advocate and bone marrow donor. And it's not by accident. He thrives on making the difference in others' lives and is intentional about striving to achieve just that. It's what drives him to be his best every day for his clients and his community. After a 10 year career in the US Marines, Charles entered the financial industry in 2003. And all of us who know him look to Charles as a servant leader and a very passionate veteran advocate. He has participated in the US Chamber of Commerce Foundation's Hiring of Heroes initiative and as a board member 
of the Mission Bay Semper Fi Society of St. Louis. He recently, as I discussed earlier, had the honor of becoming a TED Talk speaker on the topic of veteran suicide. He felt compelled to raise awareness of this serious and important issue following the death by suicide of his executive officer in May 2019. And that talk is already making such a huge difference and has been watched by literally millions. And today, Chuck and I are going to unpack that even more. And we're going to talk about why we think there is this rise in suicides. We're going to go into more about PTSD with us giving personal examples to make sure that we really hone in this message today. And I would encourage you, if you have the time, please listen to this entire important episode. Now, let's get on with this important message. I'm so excited today to have my friend, classmate from both the Naval Academy and Naval Academy Prep School, Chuck Smith, with me today on the Passion Spark Podcast. So glad to see your face again, Chuck. Hey, John, how are you? I I am doing great. Um, And thank you so much for being here and for talking to all my viewers and listeners about such an important topic. Um, Given that it is post-traumatic stress uh, month, I thought that having this message today was extremely important. And so I think for the, the viewers and listeners out there that the background into your TED Talk, which went completely viral, would be a great place for us to start today's interview. So would you mind going into that for us? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in, in theme with uh, this month and really what my TED Talk was about was uh, in the spring of 2019, May of 2019, um, I, I learned that my executive officer from when I was a commanding officer of a weapons company had, had taken his life. And so um, he was going to be buried at Arlington. Uh, and although he took his life in May of 2019, Arlington is so backed up, they couldn't bury him until September of 2019. And so I just felt like th- there was something I needed to do. Uh, he's not the first uh, friend or person I've known uh, from the veteran community that's taken their life. And I just felt like we had to give a voice to these people who no longer had one. And so in August of 2019, my company had partnered with uh, TED Talk and they uh, solicited applications. And I think there were like 2,000 applications and 13 uh, speakers were selected. And so um, that was announced in August. My executive officer was buried in uh, September. I believe it was September 26th or 27th. And the application was due September 30th. And so the application process is, it's about a three page, three or four page um, questionnaire that you have to fill out. And then you have to submit a one minute video. So uh, I filmed the video at Arlington. We had just buried my uh, executive officer. And I asked one of my lieutenants who was there to, to film the 60 seconds. And when we, uh, when we, we filmed it, uh, I asked him to raise his hand when there's 10 seconds left. And literally, I, I felt like I had just said my name. He raised his hand. I was like, what's going on? He said, you only have 10 seconds left. And so I said, okay, let's do, let's do a second take. And I crammed as much in as I could about why I wanted to do this TED Talk in 60 seconds. And, um, and that was it. I just did the second take, and, and that was all we had. And I flew home to St. Louis the next day. And uh, when I was in St. Louis, I reviewed that one-minute video. And it really wasn't that great. And I was debating if I should retake it and try to polish it up a little bit. And I thought, you know, it was so authentic. Um, if you can imagine, I had the white headstones of Arlington behind me in the, in the video and uh, it was real. And so I said, you know, if they're going to, if they're going to accept me, they're going to accept me. And uh, I sent the application on the day it was due with the video and in November of 2019, I got a call from the curator at, at TED, and they said they wanted to interview me. So I, I did that. And uh, I think probably the second week in November, I found out I was selected. And, uh, he, you know, I delivered that talk on February 5th of 2020 in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it, 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 the, the interesting thing was that um, I, I had never been to a, a TED production before, but it, it's a production. I mean, there's multiple speakers. There's all kinds of things that, that happen at a, at a TED event. 
Um, and I was backstage getting ready to deliver this talk. And I just felt like, you know, this was my final mission. I was, I can't explain it. I mean, you're just so amped up to deliver this. And I felt like this is it. This is, this is where I'm going to deliver this, this message that needs to be heard. And, um, since I did that talk and it was officially released on the Friday before Memorial Day in 2020, it, it's been viewed 2.3, 2.4 million times now on, on the various platforms. This has been an incredible response. What an honorable thing for you to do, especially not only remembering your XO, but the millions of people, not only veterans, but otherwise who've taken their lives, much of it due to traumatic events that, uh, that they've suffered. And as I was looking at the statistics before the show, um, I saw one of the latest reports that came out in 2019 that said, depending on the year, there are between 17 to 22 suicides um, a, a day with just within the veteran community. So they put an average on it uh, that goes back almost 50 years that shows the average has been throughout that lifespan, 20 veterans uh, a day take their life. So it is a, a very important uh, topic. Um, I too have known veterans um, who have committed suicide and um, I've also had a, a best friend commit suicide and, and probably very similar to your XO. Um, I had spent uh, the Saturday um, before he died uh, on that coming Monday with him. And for me, he, he had been that one person that when I was going through the divorce, um, when I was going through, you know, I had an in-home burglary where um, a, a guy had a, a gun pointed at me. He was like the one person uh, I could always call two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. And uh, on that Saturday, it was as if it was any given Saturday. Uh, we just hung out. It was a great day. Um, I found out the next day he spent it with one of his ex-roommates and another friend of mine. And then I was in New York um, about ready to walk into um, an interview taping and got uh, a call I will never forget. And unfortunately, you know, he jumped off the Skyway Bridge. And um, for me, there was no prior indication at, at all. In, in fact, he was one of the most happy, go lucky people that uh, you, you will ever meet. And I just remember that Saturday, him dancing around, just loving life. And then as it turns out, um, he, he had some difficulties with his ex-wife and financial difficulties that none of us uh, were aware of. And what led me, and I'm sure you probably had the same reaction with your XO, and we'll get into that in a second, but it just made me cry out to him, um, my anguish, why didn't you reach out to me or anyone else um, when you were in your pain? And it, is that similar to how you felt with uh, your, your friend, the XO. Yeah, John, that, that is such a great point. Um, you know, when I, when I got the call that uh, he had taken his life a couple of days earlier, um, I, I walked around and you ask yourself, why? What was going on? Why would somebody ever think to do this? Because, it, you know, we look at the world in a totally different light and we think, hey, life, life is worth living. It's, it's this great thing that we have and the future is unbelievable. And, and I might be in a tough time today, but I know things are going to get better. And I know that tomorrow is going to be a better day to, than today. And the day after tomorrow is going to be better than tomorrow. And so, you know, our outlook on life is totally different. And so I, I don't think there's a way to explain or answer it. These, these people that take that step to take their life, they are in a pain that we can't understand. And I think that it, when they do take their life, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's, it's irrational. Um, and oddly enough, when they take their life, they think that they are becoming less of a burden on others when the reality is it actually hurts the people that, that they love. And, but they don't see it that way. And so, uh, you know, as, as I've said in the past, this is a way to give a voice to the now voiceless. And uh, what, when you look at the statistics, in particular in the veteran community, the suicide rate in the veteran community is one and a half times that in the general population. And so that's a, that's a, uh, a segment of the population that is highly at risk. And we've got to talk about it. 
Um, you, you typically don't hear the services talking openly about it. And the VA who has taken the lead on this, uh, they, they talk about it openly, but I think one of the challenges they have is they can't reach everybody. And, and a lot of times, uh, these people that are in mental duress and, and have uh, uh, PTSD or uh, other type of mental illnesses, they're not even in a place to go find the VA. And so it's just a, it's just a subject that I think we have to bring awareness to. And, and hopefully they hear a message like your podcast or a TED Talk. And I know that there are people out there that genuinely care and want to help. I'm going to take the, the opportunity of this podcast to personalize this a bit. Um, I was in a number of combat situations, some trying to take out a high value target uh, in the Bosnia conflict. And unfortunately, as we were taking him um, to the aircraft, um, I got hit from behind by a rocket propelled grenade and was out of it for about 24 hours, woke, woke up in a hospital and then you know, had some other experiences when I was uh, in Iraq with um, some special forces teams as well. And I started noticing inside myself um, after I'd gotten out um, or nearing the time I got out of the military, that changes were happening inside of me. Um, you know, I was losing sharpness um, that I never had before, concentration issues, uh, migraines, light sensitivity, dizziness. But um, I think maybe it was in the Marine Corps like it was with some of the operators that I worked with. You, you just didn't talk about these things, nor the mental um, things that came with it. So for me, I just sat for decades, not even talking to my spouse at the time about it because, you know, I didn't want anyone else to know the difficulties that I was having inside. And I know I'm, I'm putting this out there because I think that there are, if not thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who were just like me. And the issue is, is that over time, um, I wasn't dep depressed when I got out of the service, but, you know, over time, when you don't deal with these things, um, then it leads to depression, more anxiety. And for me, you, you know, what's become severe PTSD over, over um, those symptoms. And so for me, this month is very personal, but I also understand the darkness that people can feel because, you know, I've, I've been there myself. So, you know, what would you tell people that you've not only served with, but who are serving today about that topic I just talked about and not being afraid to let other people in and being vulnerable, uh, which for many years I was incapable of doing um, and why it could be such a blessing for you to do so. Yeah, um, that's such a terrific point and thank you for sharing um, that story. Um, so culturally in the, in the military, and, and you know this Navy, Marine Corps, doesn't matter. If you talk about, it, if you say, hey, something's not right, I need to go see the psychiatrist or psychologist, you, you're looked at differently. And um, you, you know, we have to get away from that stigma and we have to realize that mental health is the same thing as physical health. You know, if, if a Marine breaks their leg, nobody has a problem with them going to the battalion aid station to get, you know, their leg x-rayed and, and reset and put in a cast. And if, if somebody's mental health isn't there, we need to be able to talk about it because the end result is, um, and, and, uh, for those who take time to watch my TED talk, when you look at the global war on terror, which started in October, 2001, up until um, uh, when I delivered my TED talk, my estimate that I came up with based on all the numbers that have been provided by the Department of Veteran Affairs is that there's been 115,000 suicides by veterans. That number was fact-checked by the by the TED team, because they, they will not allow you to talk about anything unless it's all fact checked. So that number is fact checked. The reality is the number that I came up with a mathematic like I could show was actually about 23,000 higher. So I, I actually came up with 138,000. TED felt very comfortable and, and could defend 115,000. So whether it's 115,000 and 138,000, it's a lot. It's a lot of people. In that same time frame. Um, and, and I used a report 
that went from uh, October 2001, uh, specifically, I believe it was November 18th of uh, 2019. Um, I, I took that from the Department of Defense, but it was their killed in action numbers. So they're 5,440 killed in action. So if you, you think about that, we had 115,000 uh, died by suicide, 5,440 were killed in action. That means we've got like 20 or 21 veterans taking their lives for every one killed by an enemy combatant. And, and we're not talking about it. I mean, come on, we've got to get rid of that stigma. And we've got to realize that your mental health is just as important, even more important than your physical health. Because if, if you think about it, if somebody gets discharged from military and they're leaving the military with a, a broken bone, um, they, we know that they have the mental faculties to go to the doctor to make sure that it healed correctly and to get the cast cut off. But if we discharge somebody who their mental health isn't where it should be, we don't know that they have the mental faculties to go see a mental, uh, mental health provider or professional to help them get through their, their darkest hour. And we don't talk about it. And that's the craziest thing ever. We've got 100, at least 115,000 that have taken their lives over the last 20 plus years. And we're not talking about this. You've got to be kidding me. What's going on here? And where is our leadership in the military to say, wait a second, we need, we need to have a, a training timeout and, and figure out what the heck is going on? Because when we talk about combat effectiveness and combat efficiencies, Losing 115,000 by their own hand is not combat effective or combat efficient. We got to figure that out. And, and by the way, that 115,000, that's veterans. It doesn't count uh, the active duty members that have taken their lives. And, and I know a number of, of my friends uh, from active duty, uh, while on active duty, ha had taken their lives. In fact, um, while I was on active duty, I personally responded to three suicide attempts. Um, uh, two of them were very, very serious. Uh, one was a, a young, uh, woman that, um, took an entire bottle of, uh, painkiller and, uh, mixed it with alcohol. Another one had, uh, slit his wrist lengthwise. And the third one was trying to cut her wrist with scissors. And, you know, that's, that was three in my short, you know, I did 10 years in Marine Corps. It, it's one every three years. Are you kidding me? Like we, we got to figure this out. Because we're losing a lot of good people. Well, and, and that doesn't even mention first responders and then the whole medical community, especially now with the past year to 15, 16 months that they've had with COVID and the repercussions long term that are going to come from that as well. Um, what do you think, as you've looked at this situation, what do you think the answer is? Is, is it kind of mandating maybe that Everyone who's on active duty gets gets uh, mental health checks, and that way you could get away from the stigma of going. Uh, because I know when I was in, I did not want to go because I had a top secret SCI and above, and I was told you would lose that clearance level. Same thing when I got out and still was using the security clearance. It was a definite reason for me that you couldn't seek the help that you needed. Um, so what what do you what in your mind do you think might help? Yeah, so um, th there's a whole bunch out there, right? Um, first off, when I got out of the military, I went to I think two or three days of, of uh, classes, and and then that was it, you know. And there was no mental health; it was all about how do you transition, how do you find a job, how do you write a resume. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, I think there's somebody talked about maybe going into the reserves, but it was a pretty basic tra transition out. Um, today, it's a little different where you'll get a call from a, a mental health counselor. And I'll tell you, I, I talked to one of my Marines and he's explaining to me how the call went. So he's already, at, this guy's already out of the Marine Corps. Uh, he's on terminal leave. He's working for a company out on the West Coast. He's in traffic in LA. His phone rings. He doesn't recognize the answer, the, the number, but he still answers it. And it's somebody who identified themselves as a petty officer. And the petty officer says, uh, sir, is your social security, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and the, the lieutenant's like, are you, are you kidding me? I'm not going to tell you if that's my social security number. I have no idea who you are. And so finally they, they go back and forth uh, and they figure out, okay, it's a legitimate call. And he takes it and, and the petty officer says, okay, I'm going to patch you through to a mental health uh, expert that needs to have a, uh, an interview with you. So he's like, okay, whatever. So he does this interview. He's in the middle of traffic in LA trying to get home. He spends 15 minutes on the phone and 
all he wants to do is just get off of it. And so he, he hurries the, the, the question and answer session along and hangs up after 50 minutes. And that was it. He was done. But if you look at all the, all the data out there and all the mental health experts, they'll tell you, you need a one hour in-person interview to determine if you have PTSD. And that doesn't happen. Um, I have another friend of mine who got out and um, he, he got the call and he said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am struggling with some things. And they said, okay, great. We're going to set you up an appointment. So he goes into this appointment and the, the woman who is helping him in the middle of her session with him, her cell phone rings and she answers it. And it was a personal phone call that she took while he was sitting in, in this, this meeting and he's sitting there like, is this like for real? I mean, like it, I've, I've been outside of the military now for 20 years. Uh, well, not quite 20 years, but if a civilian doctor ever did that to me, I just wouldn't stand for it. But yet our military members, they, they don't know any better because it's, it's all been yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Right. And they're doing their duty and they're doing what they're told to do. And yet they get treated like that. We, we need to do better there. Um, I, I think culturally, the services have got to get better at accepting the fact that mental health is just as important as physical health. And, and I think, you know, another thing too, and I touched on this in the TED talk is that um, our service members and veterans that are self-medicating, whether it be alcohol or drugs, are at a significantly higher rate of, of having PTSD and of taking their lives. And yet, and I'll speak specifically in the Marine Corps, you know, look, we always have been, and I'm sure always will be a service that plays hard, uh, works hard and plays hard. And we've got to kind of dial that back. And, you know, I talk about having the, the warrior monk mentality, like who wouldn't want to have a warrior that was also um, introspective in themselves and understanding themselves and finding balance within themselves and yet can still go out and be combat effective. I mean, everybody wants somebody like that. I, I want people like that on my team. And, and yet we don't really talk about it. And we don't develop it the way that we should. So I think there's a lot of things that could happen. But it, it only can happen is if the, if the senior leadership openly talks about it and takes action. Yeah. And, and I think that that was a great story on what's happening to people coming out of the military. I can tell you what my intake process to the VA was like, and it wasn't uh, much better. I I guess I was always one of those people, and it's my father's the same way, that we kind of thought you only go to the VA under the most dire of situations. You've lost a leg, something like that. Um, but I've reached a point where, for me, um, it, especially after that break-in happened, it kind of reignited all this trauma that um, I had pushed aside for so long. So I finally applied for the VA benefits. Um, I didn't use anyone. I, I was just trying to get benefits because I, I figured if anyone could deal with uh, PTSD, it would be them. And so I went in and I was found service um, connected. But unfortunately, they connected me for depression um, and not PTSD. So what ended up happening is then the VA starts treating you as a mental health patient. And it actually took me um, almost 18 months of advocating um, for myself, writing the head of our VA here in uh, St. Pete, Florida, the Bay Pine system, that um, they finally allowed me to see a psychiatrist who after 20 minutes diagnosed me with PTSD. But then it took me going through about a four and a half hour interview for it to fully get documented and then finally start getting treated um, for things that I've been suffering with for two decades. But what, and someone, let me say it differently, I would think most veterans would have given up long before I did um, with the system. And I think it was only because I fought it, elevating, going to congressmen, senators, um, that it finally broke through, but you shouldn't have to do, do that to get the care that you need. And so I even think that example of the intake process to the VA um, and one of the healthcare providers explained it to me very well. Um, she said that if that person had done you correctly and would have put 
because when they looked at my CMP exam, the doctor actually wrote that I had PTSD and depression, but decided to categorize me as depression. She said, had they categorized me as post-traumatic stress disorder, then they would have focused on that first and then would have dealt with the underlying things of anxiety and depression, whatever afterwards. But instead, they couldn't even deal with the PTSD because I had been labeled with depression. And so that's how the whole system was told to use their checks and balances um, with me in the system. So I think that's a whole nother area that probably needs to be looked at as well. Did you know that Forbes magazine recently cited that 70% of individuals who do personal development, masterminds, and one-on-one -on -one coaching benefited from better work performance, increased communication skills, and overall better relationships. And we at PassionStruck are obsessed with self-development, coaching, and mentorship. That is why we've created a free resource help you unlock your hidden potential. Because people doing great things in business and life are just like you, only they've had a coach along the way. And we've got that covered too. Let us show you the systems and frameworks that we teach growth-minded individuals to help them step into their sharp edges, execute on their passion journeys, and get predictable results time and time again. Go to passionstruck.com slash coaching right now and let's get igniting. There are other service measure veterans that have gone to the VA uh, and have asked for mental health help. And they've been told, well, we can't do it because uh, we got to do all this paperwork, we got to get a product, blah, 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 blah. You know, it just goes on and on. And, and there are stories of veterans who have literally taken their lives in the VA parking lot. How does that happen? You know, the, the, our nation, our nation should be outraged. You know, these are these are the sons and daughters of America that are going out, getting paid very little to do a job that nobody else wants to do. And when they come back, we need to put our full resources behind to make sure that they're successful in life and that they they live their best life. No, I couldn't agree more. So I think you're bringing up some of the right points. It needs to start with the top. I think for me, it needs to be systemic that everyone has check-ins because that would take the stigma away. Um, there, there also needs to not be a penalty or a huge repercussion that if you do go in there and you're vulnerable, that you lose security accesses or opportunities or what have it be because of it, or perhaps they send you to treatment first. Um, but just a clear sign that not enough is being done is the formation of all these organizations outside of the military and outside of the VA that are starting to come up, such as the home base program um, in Boston, a, a program that I, I've been accepted to, um, is specifically funded by the Boston Red Sox Foundation, and it helps first responders and combat veterans who have PTSD get two weeks of intensive work done inpatient. Uh, another one is the PATH program which um, is now nationwide and they do a week long initial session. And theirs is much less about post-traumatic stress active treatment than it is post-traumatic um, kind of growth afterwards. So they, they give you one week kind of, of going to intensive, um, I guess that I wouldn't call it counseling, but support where, you're, where you go with a group of six to eight other veterans. And then after that, uh, they keep you in the program for 18 months so that you have that constant ability to call other people who you go to it with or have access to the material that they put out that they want you to discuss, you know, at least on a weekly basis. And I think it's that repetition in my mind that really matters because if you just go through cognitive process, processing therapy, or you go through EDMR or PET or whatever it may be, that, that's kind of a, a one, it's kind of like getting, you know, a single dose of a shot. Um, but what happens after that, if you have flare ups or other things, or maybe another event that reignites some of the things that you've been through. So to me, it's, it's gotta be more of a systematic way that you approach this and 
I think although the, there are those organizations on the outside, we should be taking care of our own on the inside is my point. Yeah, and, and you know, I've, in conversations I've had with, with other uh, uh, veterans and other active duty members, um, you know, one of the concepts they talk about is uh, military for life. So rather than have a VA, that you just have the Department of Defense, you raise your right hand and take that oath and you serve our nation, you're part of the Department of Defense the rest of your life. So all of your records are, are housed with that one community. And you think about it, um, military members take care of their own. And so if we were underneath the Department of Defense still, maybe it would be a little different outcome. In my talk, one of the things that I, I discuss, and I think it's to your point of of how do we kind of get our arms around this and how do we bring data into it? How, do, how can we really um, figure out what's going on? There's a system, a technology system being built that's going to house Department of Defense records alongside VA records. And, you know, one of the things I suggested is what if we could take, if um, when a veteran passes away, the uh, funeral home that processes the body has to fill out the death certificate. And on those death certificates, it asks the questions, are they a veteran? And so if they're a veteran, it gets reported and goes into the VA system. But what if in addition to asking if they're a veteran, they also required, you know, how, how did they die? Was it cancer? Was it suicide? Was it natural causes? Whatever the case is. And what if you could take those data points and start mapping it with Department of Defense records? So as an example, in my unit, uh, I had 200 and I think it was 204 Marines and sailors. And in talking with my Marines, we think that we're in excess of a dozen suicides just, just out of my unit. That's like a 6%. <laughs> you know, that's right. much, much higher, much, much higher than, than the civilian community. And, and it's much higher than the military in general. And when you look at the battalion level, the numbers are staggering. They're staggering. So what if we could just start identifying like, are there specific types of units? Is it are they infantry units? Are they special forces? Are they whatever? Fill in the blank. But but if we could build those sets of data points and figure out who is at most, who's at risk the most, and the and then be proactive with regard to getting them counseling and prepping them for what they're going to go through uh, mentally and physically, so that they know it. So when they're going through it, they know this is what's going to happen. And then while they're in theater, get them the help to continue with that, that uh, building on the basis of what they're going through so they understand it and then get them help before they come home and then provide help and care while they're home. I mean, we should be doing those things. We have the technology to do it. We have the ability to do it. The funding is out there. We just need to do it. You know, somebody, again, going back to leadership, somebody's got to make this a priority and say, hold on a second. Uh, we owe it to those sons and daughters of America to take care of them and to put our best foot forward and our best uh, uh, ability to collate this data to figure out how can we have the best outcome for all of our service members when we discharge them. I mean, it's really not that revolutionary, but when you don't talk about this openly because you don't want to, or because you know something happens over in the Department of Defense and then it gets transferred, you get transferred to the Veteran Affairs, Department of Veteran Affairs, uh, and there's no continuity, you, you you get lost in the shuffle between the actions you took over in this one department and what you're dealing with over in this other department. And we've got to do better than what we're doing currently because we owe it to them. We owe it to them. I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. And I, I think this suicide issue is a whole topic. I think all for illness is a whole nother topic that's not getting enough support. I think traumatic brain injuries is a whole nother area where it's just wanting to be ignored. I, I can tell you that firsthand uh, and not dealt with because the issue, especially with some of those, it's a, it's a lot easier for the VA from a financial standpoint to categorize you as a mental patient and give you pharmaceutical drugs than it is to treat the person for all the underlying polytrauma that is really going on within them. And I unfortunately think that that is what's happening with many of the, the protocols that are being used both at the VA and in the civilian world because the insurance companies, and in this case, the government, don't want to have to carry the burden 
Uh, if you look at a person with mental health, maybe they're spending eight to 9,000 on drugs over their life, as opposed to if you're treating them truly for the poly trauma, you know, it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars that they need to put into that, that person to get them back to where they need to be. And in many ways, um, you know, my girlfriend's a nurse practitioner. Uh, she was an ICU, ICU nurse uh, for about 10 years. You know, she looks at it and she says, well, at least the military is doing something about it. She goes, for us in the medical profession, no one does anything. She goes, I, I get, uh, when I was an ICU nurse, like three to four sessions of therapy a year. Even now, she her medical plan only pays for two to three. You're dealing with near constant death on a on a daily basis. The whole system is flawed, and I think I, I think in our generation, I look at my parents' generation. Mental health was just taboo. I can't imagine my dad, you know, even stepping foot in in one of those centers. And for me, it was difficult just because, as you said, it's viewed as a weakness, and that's got to change because. Like you brought out, self-medicating, whether it be alcohol or drugs, is not the answer. Um, because as everyone knows, alcohol is just a depressant and it's going to make matters worse. Um, it's actually having that belief system that if you come forward, someone's going to catch you. It's not going to degrade on your career where you can go whether it's in the military or the civilian world, because in both cases, people look at it in a negative light. So maybe the starting point, it, it could be within Congress, and they start looking at the issue similar to some of the things that they've done in other areas. Um, or if it's in the military, I'm sure they've set up commissions, but it needs to be, as you said, dealt with at the highest levels. And passed down so that everyone knows um, whether they're still in the service or not, that they are going to get the help that they need um, and do this in a confidential manner. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I think that going back to the leadership, the, the, the military leadership has got to talk openly about it. I'm not sure, but um, I never have heard uh, leaders talk openly. I did see a video from, I think the commandant that one of the previous commandants on mental health and I watched it. And I was like, yeah, it wasn't that great because they clearly weren't comfortable addressing it. And, um, they have to get comfortable with it. They have to, uh, because they're losing thousands and thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of their, uh, soldiers, their airmen, their Marines, their sailors, they've got to, um, it's a, it's a disgrace, quite frankly. Uh, it's just what the way that we have forgotten about these people is it's really sad. It really is. Well, and I'll just take a couple other personal examples to, to, to just show what I witnessed in the military and how no support was given at all. When I was at the Naval Academy, um, we lost my company mate, Jensen Cottom, to a horrific car accident, no grief counseling. When I was on the Saratoga, I was in an aircraft behind an F-18 and the catapult failed. We were next in line to go off that same catapult, launched him directly into the ocean. You know, he perished. There was no way he was getting out. No grief counseling. Um, I was on a um, destroyer serving as combat information watch officer and we had two different OSAs light us up with Scud missiles, and we had to make a decision, no counseling afterwards. So I think to your point, there's ways that you could categorize this by either situations or places that you've served that would put people, maybe who you wouldn't even think would have been in an MOS, that they would have experienced something like that. There could still be ways that it met this criteria. They've got to you know, immediately go to get some type of grief counseling or something else. Because when you don't, it just, it, it doesn't just go away. You know, that's what I thought I could do with myself internally is I thought I could suppress it enough that, um, that it would go away. And all it did was over time cause me emotionally to become numb. 
And I can tell you, you know, that's living in hell. So I wouldn't wish it on anyone else. Um, and so my biggest words of wisdom, and it, it just comes from me, is if you're a person who's been through any of this, pick up the phone and call me or call Chuck or call someone. Um, don't feel that you can't talk about it. Don't feel like someone's not there to listen. Tons of us are. And I go back to my friend, Tim, you know, talking to his daughters, et cetera. I mean, and all, and all my friends who knew him, you brought out the point in a very clear way. He thought that he was doing us a favor by not being a burden when in fact it caused more pain and suffering than he could even imagine um, because all of us were there to help him in any way that we possibly could. And I think yeah. the same goes for anyone who's dealing with this because no matter what you've done, and how bad you feel about it. What I've learned by going through, you know, CPT and other therapy myself is, you know, you most people have so much self-blame for the actions that they've taken, but at the end of it, it it's not your fault. And you know, the biggest thing you've got to learn to do again is is to start loving yourself again and to start most importantly treating yourself internally with kindness. Because if you can't be kind to yourself, you're not going to be kind to anyone else. And I know you're, you're huge on serving others. You can't serve others if you don't serve yourself. And so that to me is the most important aspect about why people need to come forward and get that help that they need so that they can be kind again to themselves and have a support system um, that will help them get through it. Yeah. What a, what a great point. You, you know um, it's so interesting. Like, you're absolutely right. We've got to learn to love ourselves. We have to. And and what's funny is that that's almost at a, a, a completely opposite direction of when you serve, right? Because when you serve, it's all about sacrificing yourself for the good of others. And, and sometimes it, it, we've got to teach people, teach our veterans to take a step back. And, and it's okay to put ourselves first every now and then to make sure that we're okay, to make sure that we're healthy, to make sure that we're fit and that we're, we're living our best life. Um, because if we don't, we're going to constantly feel like I'm not worthy. You know, uh, uh, you know, I shouldn't be here. I don't deserve this. That's, that's so, that's such a wrong way of thinking. And, and we need to train our, our service members or veterans to always come from a mindset of abundance as opposed to a mindset of scarcity. And, and that's just a really different shift from the way that I, at least I thought when I was in the military. And, and I think that's important for all of our veterans to, to recognize and understand. Well, I think what they're not recognizing is they may be thinking that by internalizing this, like I was doing that they're sacrificing for others. But as I look back upon it, in some ways, I feel like I was being very selfish about it. And even though I thought I was serving others, I was really serving myself and the people I was hurting were others because as I became more emotionally numb, you know, obviously that impacts the relationship that you have with your spouse, your children, friends, colleagues, whoever it may be. So it's actually, I hate to say it, but I mean, it's, it's actually being selfish and you're not sacrificing for anyone but yourself. I am so thankful that you were on the show today and I think this was a great discussion, completely unscripted. Um, you know, and I know the reason both you and I wanted to do it was for the fact that hopefully it reaches some of the same people that heard your TED talk and hopefully many more who might be sitting in a situation today where they're in the darkness. Um, they have a lot of safe self hate going on. And I would encourage them in addition to watching your podcast to watch a podcast uh, by a gentleman named or a Ted talk by a gentleman now deceased by the name of Sean Stevenson, who lived 40 years of his life at two foot, eight inches tall in constant pain. And one of the quotes that I love from him is that you only have a disability if you don't adapt. And the same thing here with PTSD or this darkness, you know, you are your own storyteller in your life. 
you were the actor in that. And you can choose to either have a life of positivity or one of negativity. It all comes down to your personal choice. Um, and I, you know, was really inspired by his words because, you know, many people in his situation would look at it in the worst possible light. He choose to look at his disabilities as abilities, in his case, to help teach millions around the world. Um, why they can't give in to their insecurities. And that's exactly, to me, what part of the issue with PTSD and the suicide is. It's people giving in to their insecurities instead of, unfortunately, taking the steps to rid themselves of them. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you having me here and appreciate helping getting the message out. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Chuck. I wanted to dedicate today's episode to my dear friend, Tim Aruda on November 14th, 2017, took his own life by suicide. Tim was beloved by hundreds and hundreds. And I know if there was one thing any of us could say to him, it was in his biggest time of need, we wish he would have reached out to any one of us, would have been glad to have helped him through whatever darkness he was going through. And that is the message that I think Chuck and I wanted to get out today is it's never too late to ask for help. And I don't know what you are going through. I don't know what your own background is and the story that has led you up to this very day because I am not you and I have not faced the same trauma that you have. But I can tell you, I too was in a very deep place of darkness as I talked about on the show today and got very personal with. And it took me a very long time to finally do it but I'm so glad that I finally asked for help because it showed me that there is light out of the darkness. So if you are facing depression, post-traumatic stress, other trauma going on in your life, whether it's Chuck or I or someone else, please reach out to someone for help. There are so many people who want to give it and your life is so important and it's worth saving. And I will make sure that I put links to all the studies I covered in the intro, along with Chuck's TED Talk and links to organization that if you're facing depression or something else in your life that you can go to for help. Thank you as always for watching and listening to the Passion Struck Podcast, and especially this very important episode that we did today. Thank you so much for joining us. The purpose of our show is to make passion go viral. And we do that by sharing with you the knowledge and skills that you need to unlock your hidden potential. If you want to hear more, please subscribe to the Passion Struck Podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts at. And if you absolutely love this episode, we'd appreciate a five-star rating on iTunes and you sharing it with three of your most growth-minded friends so they can post it as well to their social accounts and help us grow our Passion Struck community. If you'd like to learn more about the show and our mission, you can go to passionstruck.com where you can sign up for our our newsletter, look at our tools, and also download the show notes for today's episode. Additionally, you can listen to us every Tuesday and Friday for even more inspiring content. And remember, make a choice, work hard, and step into your sharp edges. Thank you again for joining us. 